Hey guys, good to see you again. Thanks for coming back for another episode of Sob Talk Live, the only weekly webcast for guys who own sobs, love sobs, and just care about keeping these cars on the road. I'm Lee Kelso. I'm Mark Romisher. And this week, we're actually talking to a gentleman who drove a vintage Saab across the country quite a long distance. We're going to hear about all his uh, trials, tribulations, and all the fun times he had driving across from the... Uh, well, one end of the country to the other pretty much because uh, that is one heck of a trip across all those states. Goodness gracious. Yeah, he made 6,400 miles in a 1965 Saab 96, a little two-cycle, three-cylinder car. Mm -hmm. What a heck of a mission and a journey. Ray Kupczynski is our guest, and we're going to get to him in just a second. First, though, uh, guys, I want to take a second and uh, take you along on something that I did last weekend. I went to this little town near where I live. Uh, this little town's called Auburn, Indiana, and they have a, a big classic car auction there every year. And Mark, this year, I went specifically looking for Saabs, and uh, out of the hundreds of cars there, I think I found any. I don't know. Did you? <laughs> not a one. Not wow. a one. Yeah. So it was. Uh, let me show you. This place is this. This auction is really pretty cool. Um, so this oh, wow. is the. There are all kinds of cars of of every make and model, all sorts, and they're they're really just a really cool variety of cars, including. This uh, barn find, Porsche 356. Now, mm. this car, even though it looks terrible, is really very solid, pretty rust-free. But uh, the cars all come with an auction estimate. And uh, they thought this one was going to sell between seventy five and 95000 So there's oh, a Cobra wow. replica, a Porsche Turbo 944. That'd be kind mm. of fun to have. If you're mad at yourself, you hate yourself, and you want to drive yourself crazy, here's a V12 Jag that oh, you can pick up for about 25K. And if you really have self-loathing, here's a Mercedes V12 <laughs> that uh, it did sell. I don't know what they brought for this car. A Ferrari Mondial. Uh, I think this is the, uh, the, the the model of Ferrari that most people say was one of the worst. I don't really know, but uh, there it was, and it did sell. They also had a lot of unusual cars like this uh, Daimler. Don't know much about those. But look at this truck. Oh, Man. don't get me started. I love trucks. <laughs> this is beautiful. This uh, this uh, Chevy Apache. I don't know if this is a factory color combo or not, but man, this Bumblebee look was great. It was in fantastic shape. Oh, wow. And yes, it sold. So that's a big vehicle. But you want to talk big, check this out. Uh, a Rolls-Royce Stretch Limo. And oh, wow. these two guys did the right thing. They looked at it and walked away. <laughs> yep. Now, you want to go to the other end of the scale, go from big to small. This is Suzu Isetta. Oh, yeah. Auction the estimate is $40,000. Holy crap. Aren't yeah, these those, cool? They're, they're the most unique cars I've ever seen. Where, where the oh, front you know, opens up. Well, you think so? Look at this. Oh, Just cool. like Saab started with aircraft, this is a Messerschmitt, a German That's Messerschmitt. Cool. Built in wow. 1955, the auction estimate on that was about fifty thousand dollars. You can see wow. the aircraft influence here in the canopy, and uh, this canopy tips open. And look at that yoke to steer this thing with. Pretty cool. There was one Swedish car, and here it is. A Volvo. This is a fully race prepped Volvo. Exactly. Look at that roll cage, all tricked out for SCCA racing. Mm -hmm. and that was it. Not a single wow. Saab anywhere to be seen on this auction ground now i don't know it's, what that tells us well here here's here's my take it's surprising and also not surprising because looking at the types of cars there yes there is a multitude of them um but i get this feeling that the era of cars that we see at the show like that maybe Saab didn't have as much popularity at that time so you don't see the proliferation of sobs at that particular show also the area that you're in indiana midwest um, not necessarily a high concentration of sob vehicles there so there's less likelihood to see sobs there so you're thinking geographically you're thinking you know um historically speaking of the era of cars that you typically saw in that an event it did span a good time frame but i think that uh, necessarily it's it's tough to see a sob at a show like that um, without there being more enthusiasm for sobs that were kind of back in that back in that time frame, I'm, that's what I'm thinking anyway. 
You know, I've been going to that auction for years and years and years, and, and it's very rare to see a sob there. I don't know if it means that people just don't care if uh, if maybe they're holding on to the cars. I mean, we're seeing them show up, as we've shown people before, mm -hmm. on Bring a Trailer and Cars and Bids more often. So I don't know. But I just thought it was an interesting little way to spend the weekend and wanted to share that with you. That's so, guys, cool. if you if you got some comments and questions about our show tonight, of course, use the chat. We'll be happy to share those comments with everybody else. We're live streaming on Facebook and over on YouTube. So mm -hmm. your comments will go both places. You can put them together for us there. All right. So let's welcome Ray Kopsinski to the show. Ray is the guy who drove that 1965 Saab 96 across the country. Ray, uh, is your hearing recovered from all that noise? <laughs> uh, pretty much. I had multiple friends told me uh, early on that Ray... Uh, you're knocking futz for even considering that because uh, number one, your car's not going to make it. And number two, if it does make it, uh, you won't. And they were almost correct in uh, both accounts. So it was a <laughs> wonderful, wonderful journey. Well, we're going to we're going to learn more about your trip tonight. I think, uh, you know, what a lot of guts for to do that. So once mm -hmm. again, uh, for anybody who kind of joined us late, you went uh, from Albany, Oregon to Albany, New York, 6,400 miles. How many days did it take you to do this? Well, about three weeks total. And that's that's round trip, of course. Uh, so with stops in the at different locations for the two shepherds, I stopped at uh, Tom Donnie's place going and back uh, uh -huh. and then stopped in Sturgis and stopped at different different locations to get to get home. And uh, it all worked out. There's a few issues, obviously, that we'll cover, but uh, I wouldn't trade that trip for anything in the world. Met too many wonderful, wonderful people that I've only been able to converse with via email uh, mm -hmm. because I don't do Facebook. I don't do social media. So actually, one of my friends uh, actually did some of the Facebook posting uh, from information he was getting from other people. And what you're seeing on the graphic there is uh, me in Fort Dodge, Iowa with Tom Donnie and his 1961 car. So uh, people were giving me all sorts of high kudos for driving my 1965. Tom's driving an even older one. And he drove it up, you know, two thirds of the way from Fort Dodge to Albany, New York and back. Uh, so, you know, he should have gotten some very, very high praise for, for doing that too. But he was our leader uh, on that, the biggest leg of the legs of the trip. So kudos, high kudos to him. Mm -hmm. so, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> all the young, all the young whippersnappers get all, all the, uh, all the attention, huh? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, this, hey, this is a bucket list item. I'm, I'm I turned 73 uh, in a week or so. So, what the heck? Uh, might as, might as well. You can only do it once. I did, and uh, no, I won't do it again. <laughs> That's very, very true because of some of the issues that cropped up. But uh, uh, I was told to expect, uh, and I said, ah, eh, whatever could go wrong. You know, well, some of the things did go wrong, and. Uh, me being a, a klutz around tools, and as my uh, good friend John uh, Collins in Jefferson, 10 miles from me, uh, can attest, uh, I'm dangerous around tools, uh, but uh, he does all my heavy lifting. That's taken in the Midwest, uh, Tom's car behind me, we're at a gas station, mm -hmm. and that's my little, uh, uh, what I call a sob along. It's actually a Coleman caboose trailer uh, that we're able to hook up. I've got uh, Saab 95 taillights on it, uh, mm -hmm. and that was... Uh, uh, one of the problems that I had was the AAA, when I got into trouble one time, they would not even touch the car because of that trailer. Uh, we're not oh. going to take, we're not going to tow a trailer period in the statement, regardless of how small it is. So we had to compromise and do other things. Tom, you can see Tom's back end. He's got a couple of exhaust pipes coming out the tail end of his, because this is a much higher powered car than my little 48 horsepower, one barrel carburetor car. He's got a triple carb. He's got uh, aero seats, uh, Saab aero seats in it, so it's more comfortable. Mm -hmm. He's still got the same air conditioning zip uh, that yeah. I do, but uh, and we were both, uh, you know, copiously uh, sucking down uh, water. What you don't see in the pictures is Tom's wife is driving their big uh, pickup truck behind uh, behind us too. They were that was the safety vehicle if we had any problems, mm -hmm. um, and so she was all along. But she got the she got the air conditioning and everything else and. Uh, basically, Tom had hinted that he was going to go to Albany, New York, and I said, Albany, New York, Albany, Oregon, why not? Hey, Tom, would you mind having somebody go along with you? And he said, sure, come along, you know, and I said, and I wasn't being altruistic because I had a, my good friend in Jefferson, John Collins, mm -hmm. shepherd me 
from Albany to Fort Dodge. And if I had not had those two guys sitting on my shoulders as guardian angels, I would not have even attempted it. And we all figured that, hey, if there was going to be any problems, they would happen, happen on the, the, all the outbound to Albany, New York, and then possibly back to uh, Fort Dodge, and no problems would happen after that. Because if, if they were going to happen, they were going to happen in those first 5,000 miles. Uh, wrong. But that's another story a little later here. <laughs> you know, so uh, go ahead, Mark. Sorry. I did have a question. So being a two-cycle vehicle, I know you have to mix the oil and gas, but when you're on the road like this, driving as long distance as you're going, you're having to mix up oil and gas every time you fill up. Is that right? Absolutely correct. So basically what I was running was called a 40 to 1 ratio. So I would put a pint and a half of Redline two-stroke racing oil Mm -hmm. uh, in in the tank. Then I would add eight gallons of uh, gas. And we're always looking for uh, unleaded non-ethanol premium, which becomes a uh, rather non-existent task uh, in m- many states. So you would go for yeah. the high octane, a higher 93 octane uh, lead, uh, leaded, uh, and you know use what you go for the octane rather than you know you just have to compromise what you're going to do. So yeah, right. basically, yeah, you're you're and you can't guarantee that you're going to run into a gas station at, at eight gallons. Mm-hmm. So you're you're estimating what your um, fuel is that you're going to be using, and you estimate mm-hmm. how much oil you're going to put in. And if you're up or down, you know, a little bit, uh, it's not going to hurt anything because you're not really, you know, doing hard, hard racing with the engine. It's it's mm-hmm. just cruising. Uh, and I was getting 25 miles a gallon, and I was not unhappy with that at all. I mm-hmm. started out with uh, eight gallons of Redline two-stroke racing oil. Mm-hmm. Uh, and ended up with about uh, a gallon left when I got all done because you're blowing it out the tailpipe as you're going. So green it ain't, but it uh, gets lots and lots of smiles from people. People said, I remember those when I was in college or something like that. So that's, you know, I wouldn't trade those experiences for anything in the world. So, so you had to, you had a few repairs on uh, roadside and here's yeah, one of them, right? You were this, dragging this, your exhaust. When I started 110 miles outside or just getting started, uh, I was coming outside of the Dalles, Oregon, heading, starting to head east, and I see people smiling and waving at me and everything else, saying, this is great, I'm waving back at them, and this is cool. Well, it turns out, because I was wearing Bose headphones to muffle the noise uh, from the, the two-cycle engine, they weren't waving at me because they were having fun. They were waving at me, letting me know that my muffler was dragging on the ground, which was not cool, because I couldn't hear that with the Bose headphones. So... Gotcha. I dro- uh, drove into the Dallas, Oregon, uh, found some of that green, you see the green, red, and yeah. white wire, yeah. uh, wired it up, and then met my buddy John Collins. He caught up with me about uh, an hour later, and we actually put some plumber's tape on it, uh, which to made it a lot better, which that actually ran uh, all the way to Jamestown, New York, when it finally broke. And oh. so we got up, you know, 3,000 miles out of that plumber's tape fix. Uh, and then we had it done properly at a Saab repair shop. So that's the little okay. kit that I had on my passenger side, a passenger seat, water, uh, you know, all, everything else. This is low, low pass at about 5,200 feet. Uh, my, mm-hmm. my sign says Albany, Oregon to Albany, New York or bust. Um, <laughs> and I thought that, hey, we're at the, we're at the Continental Divide, 5,200 feet. This, we're no problems. We're ready, ready to rock and roll. No, that's not the Continental Divide. The Continental Divide was... Uh, about uh, 50 miles farther east, uh, just 15 miles east of Butte, Montana, and it's a thousand feet higher. <laughs> so oh, wow. I didn't have any jetting, uh, no, no way to change the jets. Uh, you know, I'm saying, well, don't fail me now. I was end up going up the Continental Divide actually about 20 miles an hour in third gear with the heater full on, just going wow. put, 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 and I'm saying, you know, it made it up over the top, and uh, so. Whew, Got no problems now. We're all downhill, pretty much. And uh, uh, so that worked uh, very, very well, uh, most of all the way until we got into some of the heat uh, out, out near uh, Billings, Montana, and into South Dakota at Sturgis. Uh, the heat was just starting to get really, really br- brutal along with the uh, humidity because then I was mm-hmm. taking half of my uh, a bottle of water that I was drinking and dumping it uh dumping it over my head just to cool my back now and to keep on oh, wow. going. So, oh, and physically, a physically tasking journey. Do you know, uh, Emmanuel here is asking, do you know yes. how much that little three cylinder weighs? 
Uh, the three-cylinder engine itself weighs about oh, 75 to 100 pounds, and the V4 weighs about 120, if, I'm re if I remember right. Uh, oh, not, it was not uncommon back in the day that guys would step into the engine compartment and just lift it out by hand yeah. after you unbolted it. You know, what you did with it as you were trying to climb out of the engine compartment, I don't know. I never, I've never tried that, and I'm not interested in doing so. <laughs> those <laughs> those yeah, the DKW was the first engine that Saab started with. It was a two-cylinder, two-cycle. Then they went to the DKW three-cylinder while they were in the process of ripping that off and making their own engine factory to make the three-cylinder engine that they used in, uh, all the way up to uh, mid-1967. So, oh, wow. That's good stuff. So, yeah, just a lot, just too much, too much fun. The interesting thing, people were saying, you got to take a lot of spark plugs because you're going to be fouling your engine uh, on the route on the way. I did not foul a single plug, and Tom actually only fouled a single plug. Uh, that was wow. literally uh, Saturday afternoon at the SOC. We had the vintage rides, and his car uh, was getting kind of clogged up at that time. And as we left Sunday morning, getting onto the on ramp to the freeway. Uh, all of a sudden, his his plug fouled, and he had to pull off right on the on ramp, and got uh -huh. out, and quickly changed the plug, and then we all took off again, and uh, life was yeah. good. So, I was happy with the performance of the car, actually, other yeah. than the exhaust system problems that I had, which really came to roost uh, as we came home. Well, let's uh, let's take a look at your engine. Here's your little three cylinder, and we're going to talk about it in just a second. For people who don't know what these things sound like, give this a listen. Angry Hornet. That's how I describe that. That's a heck of a sound. Yeah, and I see the comment from Justin. He's probably correct if he if you put everything yep. in. Yeah, he's probably correct. So uh, so yeah. So the what uh, what we're showing here on screen is uh, uh, while you're revving the engine, there must have backfired or something because it kind of blew the air filter open. <laughs> <laughs> you know, little little idiosyncrasies that you don't worry about until you pop the hood, you know. So, now, what's right? the story? What's the story on your head bolts being loose? Tom Donnie caught that the fact that your head bolts were loose. Well, when we got to Fort Dodge, he just wanted to check everything. He checked the wheel bearings and checked the head bolts and everything else, and he was surprised that the head bolts on there's a, a mounting bar that you can barely see up at the top center, just to the left of the air cleaner uh, that goes from the fender down to the engine. Uh, and it mounts on the, uh, it's bolted to the engine block uh, at that point. And it turns out that the, uh, putting it back on, forgot to tighten those. Uh, and we were down to like 10 pounds uh, of torque. And wow. the others were at about 35. And Tom said, no, 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 you've got to get those up higher. So he, he cranked those up to uh, 45 pounds all the way around. And uh, and they held that way all the way, uh, no muss, no fuss. So what would have happened going all the way from, because we'd already gone 1,300 miles right. uh, with no problems. Now, could have gone all the way? Who knows? Probably. Uh, but it would be better safe than sorry. And Tom's the wizard because he's down yes. at uh, Bonneville right now trying to set a speed record with his Sonnet. So... Awesome. We'll have to hook up with him and learn more about that. Hey, so while we were out there at uh, Albany, New York at the SOC, uh, I had you show me around the interior of your car. So let's take everybody on a little interior tour of your Saab 96. Uh, okay. Well, you've got, you got the usual suspects. You've got the uh, gas tank, uh, sp speedometer, uh, od odometer, temperature gauge. I've got a, a rare uh, Saab clock in here, rare only because not a lot of people have them say Saab. Very few of them have one that's got a sweep second hand that's actually working. Um, got the headlights down below here. Okay. You've got the windshield wipers. You've got the choke. Uh, four wheel flashers that we added, which didn't come with that. Then, uh, like I said, I've got, I've got I put, uh, hot wired the, uh, the fan. You know, so. Mm -hmm. and then it's hard temperature vents, temperature uh, uh, window for the in, in, inside defrost, the inside vent. You've actually got a great big uh, lever. Okay, you've got a lever underneath here 
that you can open and close to allow the outside air to flow in freely. So if it's down here, now, now it's wide open, so you've got all the air coming in. Uh, during rainy weather or you know cold air or something like that, you close that vent. Uh, there's not much to it. It's very mechanical. There's no computers in these things at all. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I don't know why they put a radio in it, but you can't hear it anyway. What's interesting on the, on that picture in there, you just you couldn't see it other than for a split second over on the right side on the uh, glove compartment door uh, was Mr. Saab Eric Carlson's autograph from 2014. He wow. came out to uh, the Redmond, Oregon SOC in, in 2014. Oh, wow. That was the last one he attended before he passed away in the spring of 2015 and autographed uh, uh, my that and also autograph my arm, but that's a different story. I see a, <laughs> I see a note from Kay Rickeston. Does yep. the car have freewheeling capability? If so, did you use it much on the trip? It's absolutely not an option to not have it and not use it with a three cylinder, two cycle engine. And I was using it uh, constantly as was Tom. And I learned a very wonderful trick from Tom as he was coming up over any kind of a, a rise or a grade on the highway, he would immediately let and come over on the downhill side. He would let off on the gas, and that would allow the RPMs to drop because of how freewheeling, freewheeling works. And that allows the piston cylinders to cool down faster. So I also then at the same time simultaneously would pull up the heater level lever to full on, and that would dump a lot more liquid into the system and allow the engine block to cool faster. Mm -hmm. So it worked well, except, you know, when you're 100 degree weather and you're just dumping heat into your engine compartment, uh, that's good for the soul if you do that a few times. <laughs> a mobile sauna. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so are you running this thing wide open foot to the floor the whole time? No, 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 no. I've had I've had this car up to 80 miles an hour. I don't really like to do that, uh, but it's because it's only a little one barrel, but it's got uh, Tom Donnie pistons in it. And it's got some other, uh, uh, he polished the crank for me several, several years ago, but it cruises down the freeway all day long. Just doesn't even, doesn't even blink. Uh, no, no muss, no fuss. So uh, yeah, that was, that was very nice. I use, like I said, I use it as a daily driver and uh, mm -hmm. uh going to have it at Sturgis next year. So looking at this car, looking at the videos that we saw just now, I noticed how clean and how well taken care of this car is. When you acquired this vehicle, was it already that condition or did you have to spend some time restoring it? No, we did have to spend some time refurbishing it. It's not restored uh, per se because it's got okay. a, a basic crummy paint job on it, uh, which, which obviously shows. Um, and that was just two years ago. So it, it still polishes up pretty nice. I tell people copious quantities of wax hide lots of imperfections. Um, but the engine compartment is very, very clean. And the thing that mm -hmm. surprised all of us from uh, my friend in Jefferson to Tom and me all the way there and back, um, it actually, you know, there was virtually no oil seepage, oil leakage, which I expected to see a lot of especially because mm -hmm. I took extra plugs for expecting it to be fouling plugs. So I was running it uh, more rich by the 40, 40 to one ratio. Um, yeah, and I see a note that it says, Tom, how to drive a two stroke, two stroke video. Yeah. He's got a huge library of videos on his site on how to maintain, fix, improve, uh, do anything with a two stroke because he lives, breathes, eats those. Uh, mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. picture that you see on the screen right now is me on our shakedown cruise. Uh, just to see how well it was going to do going up over a mountain pass at about 4,300 feet. And I'm, there I'm wearing my Bose headphones, uh, which uh, caused the problem later on. So, <laughs> so you, yeah, you'd about have to, loud as those things, car, those cars are. I, my wife and I driving our uh, 900 convertible back from Albany past you guys on the highway. Don't remember where it was, probably Western New York. And the sound of you two guys at highway speed was just <laughs> incredible we we had the top down and we went past you just laughing it was great fun it was well it was you so should cool. have heard it after my uh i have an expansion chamber uh, up on the front and the weld broke on one of the pipes so basically i was running straight pipes with no exhaust no muffling no baffling nothing whatsoever and that just oh my. that just absolutely knocks you flatter in a doornail yeah. uh, yeah. and since it's up at the front underneath your fronts underneath the floorboard up there my Bose headphones were doing nothing they absolutely <laughs> had no effect on it whatsoever I couldn't hear myself think and then to couple that with AAA not being able to help me 
uh, I ended up driving it 450 miles that way uh, to get to Lewiston, Idaho, till I could find a uh, muffler shop that would actually work on it because I was traveling on a Sunday that day and wow. nothing is open. And AAA said, sure, we've got a place for you. We'll you get you up to uh, uh, Missoula, Montana. I said, cool. Well, get up there. It's a Firestone Auto Center. And he said, who sent you to us? And I said, AAA. And he said, we don't have any muffler system exhaust here. We don't even have a welder here. Oh, great. <laughs> so, oh, man. So thanks a lot. So That's this Tom's. is not... Yeah, this yeah. is not your car, Ray. This is no. this is this is Tom's car, right? Right, right. But I wanted to just kind of put this out there as proof that these little things will move down the highway. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, again, Tom's setting land speed records with his three-cylinder Sonette. So yeah. yeah, so if you tune them properly and take care of them, uh, they can cruise pretty good. Uh, and that's and basically that's what you're doing. And Tom's got his uh, uh, tack on there that he's <laughs> working with and. That's someplace in Ohio, I think, as we're heading eastbound. Um, and, you know, it's all it's all good. I mean, I wouldn't trade that experience for anything in the world. I had fun with toll roads. Never experienced those before. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're driving at nighttime with uh, uh, speed on, the light on the speedometer, odometer is not working and it's dark and you've got rainstorm going on. If I hadn't had my Bose headphones on with uh, Google Maps and a nice lady ta talking in my ear, uh, telling me where to go. Uh, <laughs> oh, Mr. Lost. Burns, Mr. Burns from New York. I said, how are you doing, sir? <laughs> if you're traveling with no lights and you're traveling with limited ability to see your instrumentation cluster, I would definitely recommend having a mount somewhere for a smartphone potentially, or even a GPS, and that should tell your speed at least. That would be an alternative way to monitor yeah, your speed. True. Well, I did. I did. I was using Google Maps through my, I have hearing aids. Hey, I'm 72. Gotcha. Uh, and with the Bose headphones on top of it, then the mm -hmm. Google Maps was talking to me right just beautifully. Oh, gotcha. And that was working. I had headlights. That was just fine. I just didn't have the oh, odometer, yeah. speedometer lights. So, Well, they have those... Uh, at some vehicles, they have these mounts where you can put your cell phone kind of where your radio would be, so that way you could see the GPS if if you happen to have that option. But you know, it, it's every everyone's different. Yeah, and there's no way I'm going to be taking my eyes off the road because you have to drive these cars. I'm not going to be looking down at a map when I'm going sideways down the road. I'm going to I'm going to keep going looking straight ahead, <laughs> looking at my instructions and or listening to my instructions and going from there when it's dark and raining. So Absolutely. there's so five lanes of traffic on each. Uh, on you know it's a ten lane uh, freeway, five lanes on each side. So you got to oh, wow. you definitely have to pay attention uh, when you're <laughs> all the construction around under, in Lake Michigan oh, around Chicago. Chicago yeah, so, absolutely. So so I assume while you're going down the road, you're getting thumbs up and people are waving and and you must have just been oh, it was kind of a rock star experience, wasn't it? Yeah, ab absolutely. I, I was just enjoying the heck out of this. I, I like I said, I wouldn't trade this experience for anything in the world. Will I do it again? Not on your life. <laughs> <But> <laughs> I got knocked. I got it off my bucket list, and uh, you know, I said if I can go one way, what the heck? I'm going to make it all the way back, and we did. And uh, have some stories to tell and uh, events like this and articles I've written uh, in the newsletter, which is coming out. It's at the printer right now. So um, it's got it. The story had some legs and I'm happy to have been part of it all the way along. And the people that I met on the way that I had never met before, I just seen names on emails or articles they've written uh, and people that were helping me uh, were the same, those same people. And now I've got a face with a name, which is absolutely wonderful. So mm -hmm. I'll never forget that. That's well, awesome. I, I am just so glad that we were able to connect with you and share your story a little more broadly. Uh, and, you know, all the best to you. What a what a what a, a leap of courage to do all that. Uh, so good on you, Absolutely. Ray. I, I'm really yeah. impressed. Yeah, my name is an SKI. So whatever could go wrong, you know, so <laughs> too, too enjoyable. <laughs> right. Thank you. All right, buddy. Thanks for joining us. You betcha. Okay, Mark. So I guess that sets the standard. Uh, where are we driving to? Where are you driving your car to now, buddy? Oh my goodness. I'm, I've been driving, I'm daily driving my sobs, that's for sure. But uh, most of what I'm doing these days is just up to the office and back. <laughs> <laughs> right. I know what you mean. And I thought I was a big deal driving my, my uh, 27 year old car, 700 miles. So there's, he, he is in a, a 56 year old car. Wow. wow. What, a, what a mission. That's pretty great. All right, guys. Well, hey, I'm really glad you were here. Thanks for all your participation. We will see you again next week for another episode of Sob Talk Live. Until then, take good care and sob on. Thanks, Mark. See you later. 
Thanks, Lee. Everyone have a great week.